everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Let's get right to it. So let's talk more about forests because without the forests, can we live? Well, it would be difficult. We wouldn't have building supplies. We'd be throw. I mean, where's our oxygen coming from? We could possibly have some oxygen from our oceans and other photosynthetic algae. But for the most part, I think we would die. Yeah, we need wood. We need trees. We need fruit. We need housing for a lot of different uh, we need we need resources. Definitely, definitely need trees. Uh, but what are some ecosystem service functions that should be on our minds that we could write a list off? OK, uh, so they, they provide food. They provide oxygen. They sequester carbon dioxide. They provide timber. Timber is a good word to use for construction. Uh, they keep the temperature cool. Now, how does it do that? By providing a canopy so the earth doesn't necessarily get direct sunlight. Uh, they're going to absorb excesses of amounts of MPK during surface runoff. If you have a forest or bordering a farm, uh, when when it rains, that runoff is going to go into the forest and they could absorb the excess NPK. And finally, uh, like I have said before, the roots of plants tend to hold the soil together like beautiful little hands holding the soil. So they prevent soil erosion. So definitely know some ecosystem service functions of our plants. Let's get to this next slide here. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I didn't know if I was recording or not. So let's keep going. Now, the term used to describe um, management of forests is silviculture. Okay, try to get that word down, silviculture. Now, silviculture does not mean that you're basically mining for silver. It actually means maintaining a forest. What does that mean? Uh, I'll give you an example. I have a tree in my front yard, and there are a bunch of little holes inside of it. And uh, these holes are visited by woodpeckers. Uh, but if you did a little bit further research, you can tell that it's a certain type of um, a, a beetle that's actually digging through this tree. Now, I could l let it be, and eventually these beetles are going to kill the tree. Uh, but right now there's a war going on between woodpeckers and the beetle. The beetle's trying to eat the tree. The woodpecker's trying to eat the beetle. Now, um, let's just say if that happens to a particular forest and we want to use this forest as resources. And uh, if I don't do anything, then those beetles may actually just uh, reproduce and continue to destroy that resource, that valuable resource. So one thing I could do is potentially add a pesticide. Um, I could try to encourage woodpeckers from um, to live there, maybe make a suitable habitat for them. Um, I could use integrated pest management to try to get rid of those beetles. But what I'm doing is I'm managing. I'm doing something to protect the trees. Okay. Uh, what if there are uh, a, a, an area where a lot of the trees are preventing other trees from growing? Or what if there's like certain trees that I don't even like, they can't be even used for a resource? Um, maybe I'll eliminate those trees. All these are management practices. Okay, management practices are going to increase the amount of resources that you could do. So silviculture is the practice of this, okay? It would remove dead trees, parasitic trees, invasive species that might actually try to take over the forest. Uh, so this would be the proper management of a forest, okay? Now, some, some forests that have never been cut down, they're just the last end result of succession. They're called old growth forests or virgin forests. Okay, uh, sometimes they're going to be cut down and replanted with perhaps a genetically modified type of plant, uh, a tree that has fast growth and good wood qualities that we can use for our resources. And so there are pros and cons to this. Of course, if we're we're planting a GMO, we might be decreasing biodiversity. But at the same time, if we're do if we're replanting, we're still getting oxygen, we're still sequestering carbon dioxide, we're still going to get timber. And so I think there is a balance between what we could possibly harvest and so on and so forth. So there's pros and cons to everything. Let's just make sure that we understand those. So if we did cut down an old growth forest, hopefully for every tree that we cut down, that we're replanting a new tree and the quicker, the better, because we know that that soil is going to basically erode away if there's no vegetation on top. And then we want to make sure that those trees can survive. Uh, and, and so we're going to protect those trees. Okay. Now, when you plant um, or repopulate a forest, 
you're typically going to plant them in rows. You're going to evenly space them out because there's a certain amount of spacing that a plant needs. Think about it. Uh, if they're right on top of each other, all right, they're going to be competing for water, sunlight. They're going to be competing too much. And one is going to either hurt the growth of the other or one is going to beat out the other. And uh, it, it, they're, ne they're ne not going to grow to their fullest potential. So to grow for the fullest potential, perhaps they're set up in rows and, uh, and, and they're evenly spaced apart. Um, so I remember in New Hampshire, close to uh, my college up there, I went jogging one day and then I'm running through the woods and every tree, it was so cool. It was like spaced perfectly with another tree. If you played, um, um, uh, we were, we were going to play paintball and we were like, we should play here. But basically it was just like a, it wasn't even a maze. It was just rows and rows of trees evenly spaced apart. They were about 10 feet apart. It was like 10 feet tree 10 feet tree make a right 10 feet tree 10 feet tree and uh it, it, it was an interesting thing when you see all the trees the same size it's typically that this was a replanted forest okay um and, and all the trees are now growing they'll probably be harvested another time okay um okay let's continue Now, part of civiculture is also knowing some terminology that describes the type of tree removal practices. Okay, definitely pay attention to this. Now, how are trees harvested, basically? The, the one method is going to be called clear cutting. And clear cutting, um, environmentally speaking, is perhaps the worst. Economically speaking, perhaps the best. In clear cutting, you're going to remove every single tree. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter the size. You're basically cutting down everything. You can think of it as um, maybe even fishing and overfishing. You're taking the big fish, the small fish, the baby fish, the grandpa fish, every fish uh, you're basically taking. So in clear cutting, you're cutting down the whole forest. E ecologically speaking, now you've just destroyed the habitat. All the animals there have no place to live. They're basically going to end up dying. They have no food. They have have no home um, and they basically end up dying. The trees end up dying. The soil ends up being exposed to the sun. It erodes quickly. So clear cutting is perhaps the worst thing that you could do. When you clear cut too, since nothing's there to absorb MPK, now that MPK is going to go into surface runoff. All right. So what else, what other methods can you use? Well, well, back to clear cutting. Since you're harvesting all of your wood, then you could sell all that wood. And eco um, economically speaking, that's why it's beneficial because you're getting the most wood for your for your buck. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and when you're clear cutting, it's almost the easiest practice too because let's just say when I teach you the other types of terms, going and, and through the forest, walking through the forest is extremely labor intensive. And if you have big machinery going through the forest to try to find a particular tree that you're going to cut down, that's not necessarily going to happen. So it's easier to perhaps have that machinery and just uh, and, and clear a whole area. It reminds me of that movie with the uh, the blue people. Um, what's that now? It's not going to come. It's those blue people with the tail and the guy. I think he was paralyzed, and then. But like he mind melds with this thing and then and then they're in the woods, but like they're they're killing the woods and there's like this magic tree. Please tell me. <laughs> write it in the comments if you know what I'm talking about um, that movie. And if you didn't see that movie, go see that movie. It's a pretty good movie. Uh, I think it was Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. All right. Anyhow. Clear cutting, let's go to selective cutting. It's just what it sounds. In selective cutting, you're going to go through the woods. You're going to select a particular tree that you want to cut down, and you'll cut it down. This could be a tree that is reached full potential growth. It could be a tree that's hurting other trees. It could be a sick tree. You're selecting it. So just think about it, though. Now you have uh, your crew walking through the woods trying to select what they want. If you're going to make a specific type of, of uh, furniture, mahogany or something like that, you're looking for a selective type of wood. You're going to cut your um, your money, um, economically speaking, because you're not harvesting all the wood. Instead, you're selectively cutting. However, when we're thinking ecologically speaking, since you're not destroying the whole forest, rather picking a couple, you're going to minimize the amount of effects that are going to affect the organisms that live there. And so you will be leaving the, the forest intact, but you're selecting which trees that you're potentially going to be cutting.
Selective cut, uh, shelter wood cutting basically means you're cutting a tree, you're trimming it, doesn't kill the tree, you're just using it for shelter. Uh, the Another big one is called slash and burn, aka Sviden agriculture. Okay, and this is going to be a low tech developing country type of, of practice where you're just going to burn the trees. I don't understand that. Like, okay, I could understand if you don't have chainsaws, you don't have machinery to, let's say, harvest the trees and, ma- and, and take the wood, and then perhaps burning would be the easiest situation. So, in, in slash and burn, you typically are going through the forest. Um, you're going to light it on fire and then you're cutting everything down, you're lighting on fire, all the wood, all the vegetation matter basically turns into ash. And that ash is going to be very, very fertile for about one, two, maybe, maybe, maybe three years. Okay. Um, and then, so slash and, and burn agriculture or Sweden agriculture means you're, you're slashing and burning down a part of the forest and then you're going to farm on it. The the soil isn't as thick as the grasslands because remember how we talked about grasslands being the, the, the best type of soils. They have very thick, big soils. In the forest, it tends to not be as thick. Um, and, and in this case, what the ash is going to do is going to be very fertile for a couple years. But um, this causes a positive feedback type of situation. Since the soil is only good for two or three years, then you're forced to actually move to another part of the forest. And so what this causes more and more of the forest being burned down and uh, it's creating a huge problem. Brazil, this is a common problem in Brazil right now. I'm going to throw Brazil under um, under under the bus because they have the tropical rainforest there, the largest tropical rainforest, and this is a big problem there. Of course, they're trying to grow food for their people, but at the same time, they're destroying um, their 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 environment. So we had that cost of environmentalism versus you know, ecological um, or economical growth. And so sometimes oh, we need to find a better uh, a better way. And so if we do burn down this forest, and then we uh, plant on it, and then we leave that area, that area could quickly erode away. The soil, topsoil could get eroded away, and that could become a desert or what's called desertification. So deforestation tends to lead to desertification, two buzzwords there, okay? This is a beautiful example of clear cutting. And let's also talk about that term of, uh, what, what is that term when I was talking about fragmentation? of resources, right? And so let's say you're a tiger and you're a deep, deep wood species, but now you have a big old hole here. You, you This might actually cut your hunting grounds and you would have a harder time finding food. And so um, when you are, so I'm trying to meld a couple of different ideas. So remember how we were talking about island biogeography? And so typically um, now, instead of having a huge mainland, you kind of have a smaller environment and that smaller my environment may affect you. All right. Now, imagine that if this was clear cut around and now you only had a patch of of, of um, a forest, that would be uh, even worse. Right. And so uh, I don't want to start turning that into another lesson, but just understand that you could connect the two ideas together. All right, let's keep going. So selective cutting, if you look on the left over here, you see uh, that only certain trees are cut down. Now, I I envision, I don't know if you saw that movie, The Wolverine, but I think he's a lumberjack and he goes into the woods and he cuts down a tree. And then I think they have a chain and they pull that tree out. It's very labor intensive as opposed to just cutting down everything and bring it with your heavy machinery. So selective cutting is going to be better for the... um, ecosystems, the environment, but harder on your finances. This is going to be slash and burn. So you're basically cutting down part of the forest and now you are burning it and now you'll plant some crops, also known as Sviden agriculture here. So let's talk about this last slide here. And uh, this is one of those over this this theme that is brought upon, brought up multiple times. It's called the tragedy of the commons. Uh, it, it was an article written by Garrett Hardin in 1968. Okay. Garrett Hardin, 1968. 
tragedy of the commons he wrote this article and i believe the original article was a uh, i think it was goats and and back in the day how many goats determined how much wealth you had and so everybody wanted as many goats as they possibly could there were no environmental laws that basically said you had to um you know farm or or graze your goats in a particular area so let's just imagine that there was just this one hill and everybody graze their goats in the same area. Well, since everybody uh, shared a common resource, and this is the vocabulary it kind of uses, um, then, then the taking care of that resource doesn't really happen. And I'll give you an example. If you were in my classroom right now and you looked at all of my desks, who do they belong to? They really don't belong to anybody. It's public property since it doesn't belong to student A, student B, student C. No one has ownership of it, so they don't really take care of it. So I, I always see these weird drawings on on my desks, you know, circles, sticks. I, I don't know. All different things. Happy faces, sad faces, dragons, that cool S thing. You know, people make the S, the three lines, boxes, cubes, and it's it's kind of sad. Now, I'll ask people, well, uh, if I went to your house, do you have that on your desk? They say, no, of course not. All right. And why? Because my mom would kill me or something like that. All right. I'll give you another example. Uh, bathrooms, public bathrooms. If you go to New York City and go into the bathroom in the subway, Probably not the nicest place to be. Why? Who does it belong to? It belongs to the public. When it belongs to the public, okay, typically people don't have um, a, uh, a an incentive to take care of it, okay, when it belongs to everybody. So going back to the analogy with uh, Garrett Hardin, 1968, Tragedy of the Commons. Since everybody had access to this hill and everybody wanted as many goats as possible, they basically would graze their 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 goats, and other people would graze their goats and other people would graze their goats and people and people will get more goats. And sooner or later, the goats ate more of the grass that actually can grow back. So the tragedy. So then basically all the goats didn't have any food to eat and they died. Everybody died. Everybody died. OK, <laughs> Thomas Mathis. All right. And so the commons is a term used to describe a resource that is common to everybody. And then the tragedy of the commons means that since it belongs to everybody, it leads to its eventual demise or destruction. Is that true? Well, who does the ocean belong to? Hmm. What's happening to our oceans? Hmm. What's happening to our fisheries? It doesn't just belong to the United States. It doesn't just belong to Japan. It doesn't just belong to China or India or any other country. It belongs to all of us. And since it's it exists to all of us. We don't have some type of incentive to just protect it. For instance, if I say, you know, what United States is only going to take a hundred, uh, you know, kilos of, of, of tuna, and then Japan is going to say, well, I'm going to have 110, and then Canada might say, well, I'm going to have 150, and like you know, and, and it's competition. So that competition leads to the eventual demise of that. Okay, and so things like fisheries, things like air, air like air pollution, uh, things like anything available to the public is typically destroyed. It is a, a a tragedy if you think of. So if we really start to think, and I'm a big thinker, where does this come from? Why do we just destroy things? Maybe it comes from ignorance, but it also comes from greed. Is greed bad? <laughs> it's complicated. Okay, um, so in order for something not to uh, be destroyed. What can we do? It has to be regulated. All right. Uh, but of course, international law is hard to regulate. It's so easy to regulate certain things in the United States. It's not easy to regulate things out of the United States. And so with that, uh, tragedy of the commons is a reoccurring theme. And fisheries, oceans, air, anything that everybody has access to and it could even be something as simple as like our public parks they're usually destroyed people have parties and leave all of our garbage out uh if you go to a game or a stadium afterwards it's just completely destroyed if you go to a subway and you go downstairs if you go to a restaurant and people just write on the bathroom walls do you think this same person writes on their bathroom walls in their house why do they do that you want to hear a story i'm gonna tell you a story so i was i think i was in bathroom duty and I just took over and I went into the bathroom to check it out. 
And this is when we were writing down names on uh, like a piece of paper, or I think the computer we were checking people in. And, and then I, as I went in, this was like, you know, let's say going from second to third bottle, going to the bathroom. And uh, I look at the mirror and this mirror has all soap on it, dripping all down. And I'm like, why did this, how does this mirror get soap on it? Is it, it's not even a little soap. It's a lot of soap. And so I, w- I was big mad about the situation. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go look at this list and I'm going to see who was in the bathroom last. And so do you think Viteri went to each one of those students and questioned them which one? To be quite honest, I probably I looked through the list and I was like, no, nah, that kid isn't. Gonna do that. that kid probably did it. And I went to that kid, found that kid and I pulled him out of class and I was like. Because I, I have superpowers. I can tell if you're lying, right? So I look at the kid. I was like, uh, did you do something in the bathroom with the mirror? And he goes, yeah, the soap. I was like, why'd you do that? He just straight up said, I don't know. I'm like, well, thanks for being honest, but you can't do that. He goes, okay. And I was like, go clean it up. And we went and we went and cleaned it up. But uh, I don't know why people just destroy certain things that don't belong to them. All right? Don't judge. Don't judge because you probably took some gum and put it underneath the table. Question yourself right now if you didn't, but you probably have done that at least once or twice. I've never done that because I'm perfect. All right. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and uh, enjoy your weekend. Bye now.